Hello, welcome back, and we are on Lab 5 this week, and we're going to talk about sampling distributions. I have a review section here that connects some of what we've been doing in distributions 1 and 2 from the previous labs to this lab. One of the major goals that I have for you going through uh, these labs on distributions is to get a sense that chance can do things. So we already knew that, you know, if you flip a coin, you can get heads or tails. Chance can, in some sense, produce different kinds of outcomes. And uh, when we explore sampling from distributions, things like the binomial distribution or the normal distribution or other distributions, um, we're demonstrating for ourselves that chance can do things. And we're also experiencing some of the range of what it is that chance can actually do. And this becomes important later on when we want to make statistical inferences, understanding what it is that chance can do. So we're leading towards, uh, we're building foundations for statistical inference that we'll be starting to talk about next week. And this week we're going to talk about a special kind of distribution, which is sampling distributions. But before that, we will talk about probability distributions just a little bit more. So our lab today has a conceptual review of probability distributions, and then we're going on to talk about sampling distributions, which I think uh, basically that understanding sampling distributions might be the most fundamental thing you need to understand about statistics. If you can figure out sampling distributions and how to use them, make them, and explore and understand them, uh, you're going to be uh, in a good position to understand lots of different statistical concepts. So let's start with probability distributions. We'll be talking a lot about probability and distributions in lecture. We've talked about this already in previous labs. We know that if you go question mark distributions in our studio, you get to see all the different kinds of distributions that R comes along with. For example, if I press enter now, I'm going to see all these distributions show up in the help pane. We can use all of these different ones. We're going to focus today on the normal distribution. I'm back to the lecture looking at the normal distribution. We've learned that we can use the R norm function to sample numbers from a normal distribution. And we get to say how many things we want to sample. So here n equals 10, we get 10 numbers out. We get to define what the mean of the normal is. We said zero here and what the standard deviation is. And um, we can also get a sense of what this distribution looks like. For example, we could take a whole bunch of uh, numbers out of the R norm function. And I put them in a data frame here. I've taken 10,000 numbers. I've made a data frame with two columns, one called observations and another column called type equals A. So there's just going to be a bunch of A's there. And then I made a quick GG plot. And uh, we're looking at a histogram of the 10,000 numbers. And we can see it looks like a curve, like a bell curve, or otherwise a normal distribution has this shape. We're probably familiar with it. So this is review. And to connect these to the uh, larger ideas, you know, we can see that a chance process is producing lots of different numbers from this distribution. I just want to zoom in on that idea by flipping over to our studio. I'm going to go find where we are here. We're talking about this example. So we can sample numbers from a distribution. We can make a histogram. And I just want to point out that if we mess around with the R norm function, uh, let's do it right now. Let's just sample one number from a distribution with mean zero and standard deviation one. So every time we do that, we're going to get a different number out of the distribution because we're randomly choosing the number, but also the form of the distribution is controlling which numbers we're likely to get out. So as you can see, if you're looking at these numbers, um, they're not really big or small. It's not like we're seeing a, a million or a thousand. We're seeing numbers that are around zero, and they're sometimes bigger than one, sometimes smaller. 
we're seeing that chance can produce a range of different numbers. We can get a sense of that range by sampling 10,000, say, at a time, and then plotting the histogram. And you can see here the range of numbers is, we're not getting numbers very much higher than a four, or very much lower than like a negative four. Most of the numbers are in between negative two and two. Uh, by going through this, we're, I just want to remind us that we're talking about these two things. We can see that chance can do things, that it produces different numbers, and we're getting an idea of what chance can do in this one situation. That is, when we randomly sample from a normal distribution, we get different numbers, and we get numbers that look like this. Typically, we can expect the numbers to be somewhere between negative 2 and 2, sometimes a little bit bigger or smaller. Great. Next, I bring up the concept of asking about um, you know little details here that we might want to be more specific about the kinds of things that we can expect to happen. Um, so we want to know how often did we sample a value larger than 2.5? We could pick any number, but I just picked 2.5. We can look at that here. We can see a 2.5, there's two, three, four. So 2.5 is around here. We can see there weren't very many numbers larger than 2.5. So let's figure this stuff out. So what is the probability that chance would produce a value larger than 2.5? Um, how would we figure that out? So one way we can do that is by um, sampling a bunch of numbers from the distribution. We already did that. We've got 10,000 numbers here, right? In the data frame called sum underscore data. The column observation has 10,000 example numbers. We could simply uh, ask the question, which numbers are bigger than 2.5? So I've, I've used logical indexing. I've asked to print the numbers that are greater than 2.5. So I can see that there's some, I can start to see that there's 50, 55, 56, 57, there's 58 of them in this example. Uh, if I wanted R to report that value, I could use the length and I'd get 58. And if I wanted to calculate the proportion of values out of 10,000 that were greater than 2.5, I could divide by 10,000. And so I get 0 0.0058. So based off of this simulation, I can say that, well, there's a pretty small probability. The probability is 0 0.0058. Uh, now, is it exactly this number? I mean, if I did this all again, for example, I'm going to resample by pressing play. That's going to sample 10,000 new numbers do all of this again, and I get 0 0.0062 because there were 62 numbers above 2.5. So we're, we're getting a similar number, but it's not a precise number. There is a precise number d defined by the formula for the normal distribution. We can compute those things analytically in R as well without running a simulation. And we can do that using the additional functions that come along with our distributions. And these are D, P, Q, and R functions. We've been using the R function for norm. Let's just type in question mark R norm. And we can see now that there's these other formulas. So I'm gonna go through them quickly to show you what they do. And they can help us understand various aspects of the distribution so that we don't necessarily have to conduct these um, simulations to find out these kinds of answers. So our norm we're familiar with, it samples random deviates from a specified distribution. So there we go, we just sample 10 numbers. D norm is the probability density function for the distribution. You can specify the distribution, uh, in this case, it has two parameters, the mean and the standard deviation, and then you give it an x value. So the x value is something like, if on this histogram here, this is the x value, and uh, it's going to, rather than 
if you give it a number like two point negative two point five or zero or any number in between, it will return a value on the distribution. And uh, that will be basically a y value here. But what we're looking at here are counts of observed sample uh, of, uh, counts of observations with the, in each histogram bin. And instead of that, we would be plotting the probability density value. So let's just see what that looks like. Um, here we are. So I've created, I've used dnorm here. I'll just pull this out so you can see what it looks like. It just calculates uh, the values for um, each of the numbers between negative four and four as x values. If I, I've created a little data frame that makes this a little bit more transparent. So for the values negative four, negative three, negative two, negative one, and so on, um, we're returning the probability density for each of these associated values. We could look at that uh, just like this. We can see that the, the, the probability density kind of goes like this, but we've only asked for a few different values. If we ask for lots of values um, between negative four and four and plot a line, we could see that the distribution looks like this. Great. So this is one way that you can plot the actual probability distribution in R, and this would stand for all the other diff different distribution uh, formulas. So um, how could we use this type of distribution function to answer a question like, what is the probability of getting a value larger than 2.5? So what I've done in this example, I'm just gonna make the code easier to read, is I have um, produced a, a ggplot that highlights a specific region, okay, under this curve. And it turns out that the answer to the question what is the probability of getting a value larger than 2.5? The answer is given by the area under this curve. So if we could calculate the area under this curve relative to all the rest of the graph, we would be able to figure out this answer. Uh, R gives us formulas or functions to work with this. One of them is called uh, p-norm and you specify the normal distribution here with the mean and the standard deviation. For all of our examples, we're just using zero and one. And then you input what's called a Q or quantile value. So for example, we've been talking about the value 2.5 right here. So we could input th that value 2.5, like I've done right here. And we get another number, we get 0.993. So what does this value refer to? Well, it refers to the area under the curve starting from the left of the graph. So all of this unshaded area, 99.37903% of this distribution is smaller than 2.5. So we have a different question. We were, uh, th this formula returned all the, the probability that you'd get a number smaller than 2.5. We want the opposite of that. We want one minus that. In other words, we want to look at, um, one second. I'm not sure why I'm getting the error here. I think I didn't load dplyr previously. Is that true? Let's try it again. Yeah, and so we're we were showing that um, the area under the left side of the curve relative to two point five is ninety nine point three seven nine zero three percent of the graph. If we want to find the other side, that is this little pocket right here, we could go one minus, and we would get 0.9. 
0.0062, or the p norm function, as you can see here, has a lower tail option. It is by default set to true. The left to the point is called the lower tail. This is the lower tail. Um, if we set that to false, then we will return the area under the upper tail relative to the value 2.5. So this gives 0 0.0062, which is to say a small percentage, less than 1%, percent, 0.0062% is in this area. We do this, we get the same value here. So both of those are the same. Q norm does something related to what we've just been looking at. However, what if you had a question like this? What number on the x-axis is the location where 25% of the values are smaller than that value? So we're just to go look at this. And okay, so if I drew a line down the middle, I can, this thing looks symmetrical. So 50% of the values are smaller than zero, right? 50% are larger than zero. Where's 25%? 25% smaller than, it's gonna be in here somewhere probably, or 25% of all the values being over here. So what number is it? Uh, if you use Q norm, you can find out. So put in 0.25, specify the distribution, and it's saying negative 0.67. If we were to look at the graph, negative 0.6, there's negative one, negative 0.67 is around here. So 25% of the values should be less than that. And you can use Q norm to figure that out. So what number on the x-axis is the location where 50% of the values are smaller than that value? Well, we already figured out that that was a zero, and if we run it in here, we get zero. What about the number where 95% of the values are larger than that number? Well, we're now talking about the upper tail, so we could set lower tail to false and get 1.64. Now, we will probably see this number again later when we talk about z-tests. But for now, it's just, I'm showing you that you can use the Q norm function to determine these things. So here's the summary. All we did here was look at the normal distribution functions in R. We can see that by random sampling, chance produces different kinds of numbers when you pull them from a normal distribution. And we can use the D norm, Q norm, and P norm functions to exactly compute the specific probabilities that certain ranges of values can occur. So when we want to know what chance can do when you're taking numbers from this distribution, uh, we can calculate what chance can do exactly. Time to move on to sampling distributions. This is a uh, new kind of distribution. You could think about it like a distribution of a distribution, but they're very important to understand. And I think that we can use R to help us understand sampling distributions a little bit more clearly. Before I walk through this, I'm just going to draw some pictures in the little window in the top right hand corner to describe sampling distributions. All right, I've drawn a distribution, like a normal distribution, and we can take numbers out of this. So we could take several numbers out of this and we call it a sample. So let's just say we do that, we dr draw out some numbers that could be coming from anywhere in the distribution and we put them over here and we call this sample one, right? So we have a sample and let's say it has like 10 things in it. So N equals 10 and um, we can do things like calculate the mean, right? And we could calculate the standard deviation or whatever we want to do for this one sample. So let's say the mean of the big distribution is 100. Uh, and the standard deviation is 25. Now, what are we going to get in our sample over here? 
are we necessarily going to get a mean of 100? Are we necessarily going to get a mean of 25? Not necessarily. These 10 numbers could be lots of different numbers and we will calculate the mean of the sample and it's probably going to be related to the mean of the population, but it's not going to be exactly the same. Okay, so consider that we could take another sample here, call it sample two. We could take another sample, call it sample three. Every time we can compute the mean and the standard deviation, and we can just keep doing this over and over and over and over. And the question is, um, how different do you think our samples will be? I mean, they're all coming from the same distribution. We know that our samples can be different because of s randomly sampling from the distribution. We're trying to get a sense of the differences in our samples. It's sort of like asking the question, um, what could have happened when I take a measurement? So usually in real life, when you go out there as a researcher and you take a measurement, you collect data, let's just say you did this. You collected a sample of data. And you, although you can try to replicate, which people sometimes do, you might do it twice, but generally you just get the one one sample of data and you recognize that things could have come out differently and you kind of wonder what could have happened. I mean, I know what did happen in my one sample, but you kind of wonder what could have happened given that your sampling process can introduce error. And so we're going to focus on sampling distributions. Basically, a sampling distribution is just uh, the process of obtaining lots of different samples like we have here, and then calculating uh, statistics on each of the samples. And here I'll just circle, I'll use a bigger pen just to circle the mean. So if we went and calculated the mean for each of our three samples, we'd have three means. Uh, if we did this for say 10,000 samples, we'd have 10,000 sample means. And we could look at you know, put those things into a histogram and ask the question, what does that look like? And if we were doing things like that, we'd be looking at sampling distributions. That is uh, what we're going to talk about next. So I will move on to the, to the content in the lecture. So we are using sampling distributions to understand and predict how our sampling process will behave. And we're going to come across some confusing jargon. The newest thing is sampling distributions. And by the way, uh, we'll talk about this in lecture, but not for a week or two. So we're preparing you for some of those things. We're gonna learn about something called the sampling distribution of the sample mean. Now, that's what I was referring to when I suggested we could take 10,000 different samples, calculate the mean of each of our samples. We'd be looking at the sampling distribution of the sample mean. We can also talk about the sampling distribution of any sample statistics. So we don't need to, we take the mean of our sample, of each sample and look at those values. We could take any statistic of our sample so it's kind of a broad concept. This is a really long sentence. The standard deviation of the sampling distribution of the sample mean is the standard error of the mean. This is a new concept, the standard error of the mean. It's related to concepts you've already learned, but it is a concept that applies to sampling distributions and not individual samples. And we will uh, return to these things throughout this lab and also throughout the lecture as we work into statistical inference and beyond. So what we're gonna talk about in this lab is the sample mean 
getting multiple sample means, looking at the sampling distribution of the sample mean, and talk about this concept of the standard error of the mean. And I hope by the end of this, some of these terms will actually make sense. So let's go ahead and talk about the sample mean. Here it is, we can do something very straightforward. It'd be like pulling out sample one in the little picture. Sample one had 10 things in it. So I'm using our norm to sample 10 things from a normal distribution. Looks like this, there's 10 values I randomly got. And I'm just calculating the mean. So there we go. We calculated the mean of one sample. Notice the sample mean is 0.23, it is not zero even though the population distribution has a mean of zero, the sample for, the mean for this one sample wasn't right on zero, it was 0.23. Every time I press play, we're sampling 10 new numbers and calculating a new mean. This one was pretty close to the population mean of zero. So I'm just gonna press play a bunch of times and you can look at the numbers and you can see that the sample mean changes every time. I suggested before that we could do this multiple times, maybe 10,000. Here's a fast, well, here's a way to do it five times. There we do five times. And then we got five different sample means. Uh, and what I wanna do is maybe um, do this a whole bunch more times so that I could get a distribution here and start to look at, uh, you know, I, I'm observing that my sample means aren't always the same. So this one's close to zero. These ones are all close to 0.5. This one's 0.29. If I do this again, this is, oh, we're getting some negative ones here. So I'm getting a sense of the kinds of sample means I could get, but I want a more systematic sense of that. I'm trying to figure out what chance can do here. So we could create a sampling distribution. We're trying to answer the question, what kinds of sample means could we get in a situation where our sample is 10 numbers from a normal distribution with a mean zero and a standard deviation one? So we can do this by simulation. We will create 10,000 samples, each with 10 observations, and compute a mean for each of them. And we can save and look at a histogram of all the sample means in a, uh, in a plot. We're gonna use the replicate function to do something 10,000 times. In this case, we were just going to take the mean of a sample from a normal distribution that has 10 observations, mean zero, standard deviation one. So put all of these things into sample means and they are right here. There's, as you can see, there's uh, 10,000 sample means. That's a lot to look at. So I'm just gonna throw them into a histogram. Now we can look at the histogram and this histogram is basically what I'm talking about when I refer to a sampling distribution. It's not the original distribution. Let's look up at the original distribution. Scrolling up, there it is. Here's a better picture. Here it is. This is the distribution where the individual values came from. And notice most of the individual values, um, they, they're between, I don't know, negative three and positive three. So there's a quite a range, I'd say, even negative two and two. Most of the values are between negative two and two. What is this histogram? Remember, we're kind of removed now because we have taken uh, many individual samples of 10 and calculated the mean. So these, this is a histogram of 10,000 means of samples containing 10 things each. Notice now the sample mean is very likely to be between negative five and 0.5. It's a much restricted range. You basically never see a sample mean that's as large as positive two or negative two. So this is a sampling distribution. It refers to the concept of 
what a sample or a property of a sample, such as a mean, would look like if you kind of took lots of samples. Like I said before, a lot of times you would get one sample in real life and you get one mean. And you might say, well, I got a mean of 0.25. So is that reflective of the population? Is the mean that you got something that is normal or expected? Or is it a weird value? If you could somehow look at a sampling distribution, which is basically going to tell you what you could have got, you could compare it and see if it was uh, something that was expected. Like a 0.25 would be around here. And I would say, yeah, uh, in this case, a sample could easily have a mean of 0.25, right? If you were sampling from a normal distribution and you took 10 numbers, the mean was zero and the standard deviation was one, and you got a sample mean of 10, that would be really weird. Look, it basically didn't happen even one time, nowhere close to happening uh, out of uh, 10,000 different samples. So in a, a value like a mean of 10 would be very strange. Okay, so the point here is that when you take a sample from a distribution, you can calculate properties like the mean. You could calculate other properties if you wanted, like the standard deviation. Each of those properties we refer to as a sample statistic. So a mean is a sample statistic, a standard deviation of a sample is a sample statistic, the median, the range, the wh whatever you want is a sample statistic. If you get lots of samples, calculate lots of, calculate a sample statistic for each of them, through a simulation process like we're using, you can create these sampling distributions. And you can look at what you basically should expect from your sample. I'm trying to connect to the next idea here, the standard error of the mean. The standard error of the mean is a way of formalizing this variability that we're seeing. So, uh, for example, just how different would my sample mean be? We can see that it can have values, let's say, roughly between negative 1 and 1, and some values in between. Mostly it's going to be 0. How can we describe the variability associated with this distribution? If you remember, we already have useful statistics to describe variability. One of them is called the variance. Another one is called the standard deviation, which uses standardized units. So this distribution of sample means, uh, we could just summarize it using a standard deviation statistic. If we did that, we would be computing the standard error of the mean. And um, it turns out, if we just go down to the standard error of the mean, talk about it for a second. There is a formula, it's right here, it's kind of hard to read, but it is the standard deviation of the population divided by square root of n, which is the sample size. This tells you uh, analytically, and I'm not going to prove it here, uh, the standard deviation of this distribution. So in the example, what we do is try to measure the standard deviation, uh, or we calculate the standard error of the mean, which is really just the standard error of, or the standard deviation of this distribution. We do it two ways to compare them. First of all, uh, I just use R to calculate the standard deviation of the sample means that I generated. And here we get 0.316. So that's the standard deviation of the data that went into this graph. And that 0.36 sounds about right. So one standard deviation would be about here, 0.36, and another standard deviation would be about here. So it's, it's probably about right, um, but it's not an analytic solution. We do it again, we'll get a slightly different value, 
0 0.316, 0 0.32. So it's bouncing around because every time we do 10,000, it's 10,000 different ones. If we bump this up to, I don't know, quite a larger number, it takes a little bit longer, but uh, the value that we get should be pretty precise. It should be pretty true to the, so 0 0.316306, let's just hold on to that for a second. When we go and use the, the formula, which is basically the standard deviation, uh, which is one, that is the standard deviation of the population that we're defining in the normal distribution function, divided by square root of 10, 10 is the number, it's the sample size, and what do we get when we do that? We get 0.3162278. So this is the true expected value. And the calculated value that we had was 0.3163, which is pretty close, very, very close, based off of the simulation. I'm going to return this to 10,000. All right, so uh, that's it for our lab today. We've talked about sampling distributions, which is really a simple idea. It's just taking multiple samples out of a distribution and calculating a statistic and doing that several times through a simulation process to get a sense of what could have happened. And we can use this later for comparison. So if I just, you know, had a particular sample mean like a a 0.75, I could look at, if I had this kind of distribution, this sampling distribution of the mean, I could look at it and see if my, my sample mean that I got was weird or not weird. And the generalization problems uh, present some of these kinds of questions to you. And by answering them, you'll be preparing yourself for the future weeks where we use similar processes to do statistical inference. So the next video, I will do some solutions to these Lab 5 problems.